Okay, we'll just make a start. Okay, Mark. Hello there, everybody, and you're all very welcome tonight to Reclaim the Enlightenment. We're just going to make a start here with our William Sampson uh, talk by Fiona Pegram. Fiona Pegram participated in our Harps Live Festival in last summer, and she's a very accomplished speaker and researcher. So I'm just going to hand you over to Fiona now, and she's going to take it from there. Okay. Right, so before I start my presentation on William Sampson, let me give you a little background as to how this talk came about. Last year in the summer of 2022, a collaborative festival celebrating the 230th anniversary of the Belfast Harpers Festival took place. As part of the modern festival, there was a celebration of the life and music of Dennis Hempson. Dennis Hempson was one of the harpers that had attended the 1792 festival when he was in his 90s. He was born just outside Garva, but spent most of his life as a traveling musician. Um, before retiring to McGilligan on the North Coast, where he died in 1807. He had been interviewed by a local Anglican minister, the Reverend George Fawn Sampson, in 1805, and it was the details of his life recorded that formed the basis of research for an online talk that I did on Dennis during the 2022 festival. I had mentioned that Reverend Sampson had a brother, William, a barrister and United Irishman, who had been exiled to America. He had written his memoirs, which had been first published in 1807. I thought at the time that William had been imprisoned in the military fortress at Fort George, Scotland, but the events for William took him to Europe. He begins his memoirs writing these words. At length, my friend, I take up my pen to comply with your desire and to give you the history of my extraordinary persecution. From it, you may form a judgment of that system of government which drove the unhappy people of Ireland to revolt. But to judge rightly, you should also be aware that of many thousand such cases, mine is one of the most mild. So before I talk through the contents of William's memoirs and his most extraordinary persecution, let's look at William Sampson's life before. So the Sampson family had been in Ireland since Elizabeth's reign, when Richard uh, Sampson had settled in County Donegal. William Sampson descended from three generations of British army colonels, followed by two generations of Church of Ireland ministers, one of which was William's father, Reverend Arthur William Sampson. William was born on the 1st of January, 1764, in the city of Derry. His father was curate at Templemore, although as was the practice, he was also the vicar of Laid, which would have supplemented his curacy income. William's mother was Mrs. Mary Mercer, daughter of George Spate, alderman of Carrick Fergus. And by his mother's line, William was connected to Mr. Dobbs Spate, one of the original framers of the Constitution of the United States in 1776. William also had at least two sisters, Margaret and Mary Ann. William was the youngest son. His eldest brother was Michael. He would also become a lawyer and would die in America. And another brother was George Fawn Sampson, who would later become the third generation of Church of Ireland ministers in this line, or in this line. At about the age of four, he went to live with his father's aunt, um, who was referred to by the harper Dennis Hempson, 
who gave anecdotes about Samson's grandfather and great aunt at whose houses he used to attend. The United Irish the in the 1900s, just over 100 years ago, was taken under the charge of his father's aunt, an eccentric maiden lady who seems to have adopted the Spartan system of education, at least in physical development. During his childhood, he was distinguished for his superiority in manly exercises and particularly for his skill and courage in Paris, and uh, in the species were wrong here. Marshall during his entire life. Now, many histories of William record him as attending Trinity University, Dublin, and apparently he left without completing his degree. His two brothers both attended and obtained their degrees from here. The university admission books are now available online, but no record of William has yet been found in them. Neither is there a record of any degree in his other admission records. In 1781, his father died. At the age of 22, in 1786, he was in America. When full of ardor of youth, and this is his spelling, not mine, I was proceeding on my first voyage to America by invitation of my uncle, Colonel Sampson, to inherit a pretty rich estate which he possessed in that county of North Carolina, which still bears his name. On April the 22nd, 1790, William Sampson, his occupation noted as Gent, joined Lincoln's Inn in London. Claire Ryder writes, it was common for the sons of gentry to join an inn of court to gain a general education and cultivate advantageous connections. It was seen by many as an appropriate finishing school for gentlemen. On the 19th of August, 1790, William had returned to Belfast to marry Grace Clark, the daughter of a deceased linen draper who lived with her mother, Catherine Ann Clark at Castle Street, Belfast. What's Samson really like? describes her as she who had been reared in the lap of indulgence and never known either hardship or deprivation. Grace returned to London with William and their first daughter, Catherine Anne, was born on the 26th of June, 1791 and baptized at St. Martin's in the Fields, Westminster in July. Whether William was using the Lincoln's Inn education as a finishing school or had plans to become a lawyer was not clear at this stage. However, as was a requirement for all aspiring Irish barristers, they had to attend one of the four inns of court in London first before being admitted, an obligation that was in place from 1542 until 1885. This meant that when he returned to Ireland in 1792, he could be admitted to the Inn of Court of Ireland, the King's Inn of Dublin, and practice as a barrister, a lawyer who represents a litigant as an advocate before a court of appropriate jurisdiction. He lived in Dublin during term time, but his regular place of abode was Belfast. Shortly after their return to Ireland, their first child, Catherine Anne, died. To manage the grief, William mm -hmm. focused on his legal work and began working the Northeast Circuit with John Philpott Curran. He writes, I was generally engaged for those on the Northeast Circuit charged with treason, sedition, and union. I had a full opportunity of knowing their sentiments when nothing was or could be concealed from me. I was here also a disinterested witness, for I was connected with the accused at that time by no tie but the sympathies of humanity, and certainly not of interest, since all my hopes of advancement lay the other way. It shocked me to see hundreds of thousands of my countrymen among whom were many possessing all the purity and all the virtue that could adorn their species, branded as traitors and living at the mercy of the veriest and vilest traitors. Man manhood could nor ought to endure it and seeing the crisis at hand when there could be no more neutrality, I took in open court the oath of the United Irishman, repeating it from the very document on which my client then stood for his trial. 
Now, William says he never joined the United Societies, but kept himself free to act as their advocate with Curran, and he never took the United Irish Oath except in court. Now, some examples of the cases he was involved in. In May 1794, William appeared as junior counsel in the trial of the proprietors of the Northern Star for libel. He was presented with an inscribed silver vase as a token of their appreciation. He was also a very active contributor to the Northern Star and the press newspapers, both established to expose the follies and crimes of the British government. In 1795, he acted for the Reverend William Jackson against a charge of high treason, defined as conspiring and intending the overthrow of the English interest and Protestant ascendancy. And at the time of William's ordeal and that of many others, it meant nothing more than a person opposed to the domination of a corrupt and bigoted faction. In 1797, he was the lead counsel in the trial of William Orr for administering the United Irish Oath. William was still hopeful that there would be reconciliation with the government. On the 31st of May, 1796, the French being at Bantry Bay, the sovereign of Belfast, John Brown, called a meeting asking the inhabitants to arm themselves in defense of their country. The meeting was addressed by Councillor Sampson amongst others, and he spoke in defense of the loyalty of the Liberal Party of Belfast and their readiness to oppose the enemy. A committee was formed, and on the 2nd of January, 1797, Councillor Sampson took the chair and six resolutions were passed described by Lord Clare as so treasonable in nature. The military commanders and magistrates of Ulster now started acting beyond the law, searching Sampson's house for Nielsen and destroying the press of the Northern Star. Lord Clare, as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland and Head of Justice, vindicated these activities in the Irish House of Lords, resulting in an act being passed, allowing grand juries to prosecute papers for sedition and authorizing magistrates to seize and destroy the printing materials. William would later state that he had no idea that the French had been invited at the time of the Belfast meeting. So that now brings us back to the memoirs. So William begins his memoirs, um, they're written as a series of letters to a friend and spans 1798 until his letter to Lord Spencer, the Secretary of State, about his arrival in New York on the 4th of July, 1806. There are over 300 pages to these memoirs and I don't have enough time to take you through everything tonight, but he what he endured is that he's a prisoner from 1798 until he reaches America and he was never put on trial for any offense by the British government. On the 12th of February, 1798, William was charged with high treason by the Alderman of Dublin. Mr. Stockdale, the printer of the paper called the press, had been imprisoned for refusing to answer questions. Samson, as his counselor, visited his wife at her house. There was a large military presence there. A parcel of ball cartridges previously deposited with the consent of the sheriff spilled on the floor and the soldiers declared that Croppy's pills had been found. Samson was immediately surrounded by 20 bayonets presented to his body, each soldier encouraging their comrade to run him through. He was taken prisoner, told that there was a charge against him and to return the next day, which he did, but he was denied access and the matter was closed. On the 12th of March, 1798, a day famous for the arrest of many men distinguished at that time by their qualities, but more so by their suffering since. Samson's house was searched. It was claimed that an officer had found a commission naming Samson as a French general. This false fact was then proclaimed to the young gentleman of the college cause of yeomanry on parade. Samson was away from home, so he went to a place of safety and wrote a letter to the Lord Lieutenant, Earl Camden, and another to the Attorney General, Mr. Wolfe, offering to surrender immediately if he was offered a trial. He didn't receive an answer and remained in Dublin until the 16th of April, until the terror became so atrocious that humanity could no longer endure it. 
in every quarter of the metropolis, the shrieks and groans of the tortured were to be heard, and that through all hours of the day and night. Men were taken at random without process or accusation and tortured at the pleasure of the lowest dregs of the community. Bloody theatres were opened by these self-constituted inquisitors and new and unheard of machines were invented for diabolical purposes. It has not happened before in any country or any age to inflict torture and offer bribe at the same moment. In this bloody reign, the coward and the traitor were sure of wealth and power, the brave and the loyal to suffer death or torture. Men were hung up until their tongues started from their mouths and let down to receive fresh offers of bribe to betray their neighbor or discover against themselves. On the 16th of April, 1798, Samson took a collier ship for Whitehaven and was arrested on landing. He was sent to Carlisle jail for refusing to give his name and his servant, John Russell, was sent to Whitehaven workhouse. He writes, though I never did, nor never shall fear my enemies, I did not think it wise to brave them at the moment, seeing they had the power of putting me in jail from whence the law had no power to set me free. And I therefore passed by the name of Williams. Many attempts were made to get my servant to disclose his name, but he refused. Samson obtained leave from the magistrates and jailer to write to the Duke of Portland, then Secretary of State, requesting to be sent to trial if charged with a crime or if justice was not to be granted, then to remain in Carlisle rather than be forced back to the horrors of Ireland. He was ignored and sent back to Dublin with his servant. Landing on the 5th of May, he was taken to the, the apartments of Mr. Cook and then under guard sent to the castle tavern where two sentinels were placed in his room. Samson learned from them the extent that the military had been encouraged to be brutal. All their crimes now indemnified by law. He was taken on the 7th of May with a long procession of prisoners to Bridewell and locked up in dismal solitude for many months before being given the notice of a trial. His servant, John Russell, found protection and service with Mr. and Mrs. Leeson. He was allowed to come for his linen and stand under the bars of Samson's window, but could only speak to Samson in the presence of a guard. Once a notice of trial had been given, Samson sent for Mr. Vincent, but there was no thought of trying him. Mr. Vincent wrote to the secretary, Mr. Cook, for leave to go and see Samson, but it was refused. Vincent copied the note and gave it to Russell. The jailer read it and afterwards it was handed up. Russell was then pursued, dragged forcibly from Mr. Leeson's house to the barracks of the Cavern Militia, where he was put to the cruelest torture. One executioner was brought to relieve another. His back and shoulders were first mangled and then the rest of his body bared and wantonly lacerated. This done, he was thrown raw and smarting upon the boards of the guardroom with the threat of a similar execution the following day. Mr. Leeson with difficulty obtained a favor and saved him. And that, says Samson, was the end of the famous notice of trial. In June 1798, British General Charles Cornwallis was appointed by as both Lord Lieutenant of Ireland and Commander in Chief in Ireland. Samson says he was somewhat wiser than his predecessors. He saw how nearly all was lost and formed a better plan. He shut up the houses of torture. Upwards of 70 prisoners, against whom no evidence appeared, had signed an act of self-devotion and peace was likely to be the result. There was so much courtesy that Samson was more than once permitted to go out of the prison and to return on his word. However, one day it was announced that the scaffold was erected for the execution of William Byrne. The preservation of whose life had been a principal motive for the signature of the previously mentioned agreement. 
Lord Cornwallis wanted to stop the execution, but the faction had argued that the agreement was ineffective in so much as Mr. O'Connor and Samson had not signed it. Samson called Mr. Dobbs to offer a signature on condition that execution was suspended. It was too late. This young man who was 21 years old was married to a woman he loved and she had just given birth to their first child. Oliver Bond's life was next threatened. Samson had much friendship and great respect for his virtues. Oliver Bond died a few years, days later, unaccountably in his prison. The agreement that Samson with the other prisoners had signed said in express terms that we the subscribers should emigrate to such a country not at war with Great Britain as should be agreed upon, taking with us our families and property. The prisoners had honorably fulfilled their part of this agreement and Lord Cornwallis assured them that the government would religiously fulfill its part. It was recommended that Samson go to Portugal, then governed by England. Permission was refused. He asked his friend, Mr. Alexander Montgomery, to represent to Cornwallis the dangerous state of Samson's health, the cruel denial of justice or trial, the torture of his servant and his secret imprisonment. Eventually, the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Cornwallis, permitted him to go to Portugal, although it took from July to October to draw up the instrument of security. It was made a crime for anyone to correspond with Samson, and he was torn from his family for being suspected of treasonable practices. A small vessel called the Lovely Peggy was ready to sail, and the jailer was ordered to set Samson free. His servant, John Russell, followed after him to make arrangements with Captain Knight. Outside, people were rejoicing for Lord Nelson's victory, and many of the yeomanry were in disorder through the streets. There was a group squibbing cartridges on the flags in Abbey Street, and one taking offence that we wore our hair short, called out troppies, which was their word of attack, and just as we passed, fired a blunt cartridge into John's shoulder. He never disclosed what had happened until we were at considerable distance and we went into a shop to examine it and found that his clothes had been pierced through and the point of the cartridge forced into the very bone. At least it was well calculated to cure me of any regret I might have at leaving my native country. We were returned to the Bridewell where, with my wife, I spent the last evening in the society of my fellow sufferers. The following day, Samson went into the shop to buy a number of things and also to go to the custom house for a paper called a bill of health. On returning to his lodgings, his brother came to tell him that there was a crowd of people at the castle complaining of him being on the streets. He wrote a letter of apology, but heard no more of the matter. He was free for nearly two months but made four unsuccessful attempts to leave, beaten back by the furious gales. He describes the vessel as very small and deeply laden. He could not be upright in the cabin and the deck was always wet. The fifth time the lovely Peggy went without Samson and was promptly captured by the Spaniards. Lord Castlereagh sent a message informing Samson that he had to go back to prison. Samson was preparing to go on to another brig called the Lovely Mary and went to live on board until the weather improved, creeping out at night to see his wife and returning before daybreak. On the 24th of October, the captain was ordered against his will to sea. And on the 27th, the ship was wrecked on the coast of North Wales. Mr. Robinson, a clergyman, helped everyone to shore and they stayed at an inn kept by an ancient sea captain called Jones. Samson says the food wasn't good, but they had a harper to play at dinner and they danced to his music in the evening. Samson wrote to the Duke of Portland, Secretary of State, and also to Lord Cornwallis. He was told to either stay until the vessel was repaired or to go to Falmouth to get on the first packet to Lisbon. Lord Clare and some other judges 
had published an order that Samson, together with those of Mr. O'Connor and Mr. Emmett, were struck off the list of barristers. From about 27th of November until late January, he remained in Wales. There were plenty of false stories about him in the newspapers. Samson fell ill, but on the 12th of February, he rose from his sickbed and embarked for a porto, where he arrived after about three weeks passage. He was kept on board for several days before a party of men armed with swords came to take him to see the mayor, where he was detained for a while, but then dismissed. Samson had trouble finding lodgings, but Mr. Thomas Nash, an English merchant, offered him help. Samson decided to stay in El Porto and wrote to his wife, telling her to come with their two children. He says, my chief pleasure was sailing upon the river in a little boat accompanied by an exiled Frenchman and my servant. However, on the 22nd of March, he was seized and taken to the mayor's house. One half was a prison and the other half a palace. He was arrested, apparently, on the order of the English ministers for something he was supposedly writing and his papers were seized. He decided to learn to speak Portuguese and get the guards to help him. And for the first time in his life, he was brought to trial. The same minister who arrested him now came to judge him. He was asked about a letter from a Mr. Seeley of Lisbon who had refused to help Samson with credit as he cannot on account of his political principles comply with his request. Samson's health was again affected. The pain in his chest increased and he lost all his appetite. A doctor was allowed to get him a plaster for his breast and he was permitted to receive a visit from Mr. Nash in the presence of an interpreter. It was proposed that he set out for Lisbon and see the English and Portuguese ministers and be set at liberty. The following morning, the 1st of April, three armed men put him into a litter. His servant was mounted on a mule. There was no freedom though, as on the 8th of April, they arrived at St. George's prison, where he was taken through a long filthy passage to a dungeon. His health suffering, he paid for a better room and was moved to one where his servant could stay. They shared it with a Dane. The Dane disliked the daily exercises of godliness where prisoners were obliged to sing and any lagging of devotion resulted in a blow of a stick by one of the keepers. Taken altogether with the clinking of the chains and the sound of the cudgel, it was very far short of what we may conceive of choiring angels. Samson wrote to Mr. Walpole, but the messenger took it to the head of police instead. Eventually, John Russell was able to get a letter to him. After much difficulty, Samson was given immediate notice to leave. Despite the difficult circumstances, his humor comes through. He writes, my chief amusement had been scratching some rude designs upon the walls of my recess, which John had embellished with festoons of oranges. Samson was taken by carriage to the jail of Bellum, where he played, paid money to be moved to a better room. For several day, hours every day, the son of the jailer, who was an organist to one of the churches, took pleasure in the English airs and country dances, and I wrote him down from memory, somebody liked best. I had also a German flute, but could play but little on account of my breast, which was still painful. After six weeks, he was called to prepare for an immediate departure. He had to say that he would not return to Portugal on pain of perpetual imprisonment, and he had to pay for his travel. In May, 1799, he was put on board a little Danish dogger called Die Hoffning, the Hope, and handed a passport for the port of Hamburg. He took sick and emerged to find out that they were heading for Bordeaux. For six weeks, he was tossed about in this little vessel, moving further away from their destination. Provisions started running out. We had no longer anything to live upon, but hard rye biscuits and bad water with brandy and raw sugar, very little salt fish and salt meat. This diet, together with the vexation I experienced, was nearly fatal to me as the pain in my chest became intolerably severe. I asked the captain to land, but he refused to land in Portugal and then refused in Spain. 
I asked him to buy a boat from him. This was refused. The captain became more disturbed every day and resorted to consolation in the brandy bottle. Twice a day, he took his little ship's company down to sing hymns for a fair wind. At length, and with difficulty, they entered the port of St. Sebastian. Samson applied to the Captain General for a passport to proceed by land. He was first threatened to be arrested as a subject of the King of Great Britain. However, he prevailed and finally he obtained a passport to follow his destination as far as the frontiers of France. In June 1799, he arrived at Bayonne and eventually he was given an instrument that would act like a passport to get him to Bordeaux. It was actually designed to take him further, but Samson stopped at the first place. With party spirit increasing, Samson retires to the banks of the Dordogne in good time. It is during this period that John Russell, his faithful servant, died of fever. He was buried in the churchyard, St. Jerome, bearing upon his body to the grave the marks of torture he had undergone. There are many letters in the memoirs demonstrating that Samson's family were trying to get him help and freedom. Eventually in 1802, Mrs. Samson arrived to be with her husband, having got permission to do so. From here, Samson says life became more domestic and they educated their two children in various languages for three years. However, the declining health of their son and the desire of Mrs. Samson to revisit her mother meant that they decided to return to Ireland. Samson applied for a passport to go to Hamburg, and this was granted. It was given to him as a prisoner of war. They arrived in Rotterdam and could no go no further as their son was taken ill with a fever. But Mr. George Crawford, a Scotch gentleman of good fortune, accepted strangers from every corner of the world. They left Holland at the end of June and reached Hamburg in July. Samson presented himself to Mr. Thornton and asked for permission to take his wife and children home before he himself left for America. Unfortunately, with the unsettled state of Europe and no response from those in power, Samson took a boat with his wife and children to England. On arrival in London, the family booked into a hotel and Samson headed to meet with Lord Spencer. He immediately realized that nothing had changed. The family were made to leave the hotel and stay with Mr. Sparrow. Samson was once again in a prison. His wife and family remained with the Sparrow family and Samson was sent to Falmouth to await the next packet to America. On the 12th of May, he boarded the Windsor Castle packet and set sail for the city of New York, arriving on the 4th of July. He writes, on the 4th of July, a day ever memorable, for memorable in the annals of America, I arrived in the waters of the Hudson, but I did not reach the city until most of its inhabitants had retired to rest. And now that my travels are at an end, that I am at length arrived in a land of peace and liberty, let us for a while repose. Now there's plenty more to this story, but not enough time to tell it. William Samson became a very, very successful lawyer. His wife and children, John, aged 16, and Catherine, aged 14, joined him in October 1810. His son returned to England, where he was educated, and then he came back to America. He died in 1820. Their daughter, Catherine, married William Tone, son of Wolf Tone. <laughs> William died on the 28th of December, 1836. He had requested that he was buried with the, uh, Ricker, at the Ricker family plot at the Riker Lent Cemetery in Queens, New York, but was later removed and interred at Greenwood Cemetery, Brooklyn, New York, with his wife and daughter. Now, before I end, I'd like to um, repeat a few words that were written on his character, if I can actually see this. So it reads, Mr. Samson, so the great qualities of his mind added a refinement, and they say a poetry of feeling, which enabled him keenly to relish the real beauties of nature and to tinge even the commonplace realities of life with a bright and pleasing colouring. He had always great delights in nature 
and during his years of health and vigor, was never without food, large enough to hold himself, his friends, and their families. And it was one of the greatest pleasures to collect these together and make excursions up the river to visit the Rippers, his friends at Barrow Bay. The south New York up the East River is one of such variety and beauty with just sufficient power passing through the narrow passage called Hellgate to give it a romantic interest. But Mr. Sampson was a master of boat craft and used safety to conduct his little vessel through all dangers until it entered the smooth waters of the bay when he would give notice of his approach by playing an air on his flute, always his companion. And he was greeted by a half before his boat could reach the shore. Everything okay? You seem to have disappeared, Fiona. She should, um, she should stop sharing her screen. Uh -huh. if, if she stops oh, sharing she. her screen, we'll be able to see her. Oh, there she is. Hello, Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoying your talk. It's fantastic. Um... Hold on. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Is somebody sharing it? Do we do we have a chairperson? Oh, okay. uh, something went wrong with slide. Looks like we played with me. Oh, okay. It doesn't really matter. It was good enough about the slides, wasn't it? Oh, brilliant. Uh, Brian, talk. Fiona, thank you very much. Does yeah, anyone... Thanks very much, Fiona. Very good. Yeah, could I say could I say something? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Really, really delighted with that. Um, I uh, came across uh, a lot of Samson when I was doing the, my book on Drennan, and it seems to me that when he was in Dublin at that time, uh, in early seventeen ninety eight, he was very much the editor of the press, the, the press newspaper. Uh, this was the most seditious paper. It only lasted. It, it only lasted about three months before it was. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 just the day uh, it was actually suppressed, Drennan tells us that he called around to Samson's house uh, to get some documents from him that he thought was better shouldn't fall into the hand uh, the hands of the authorities. So he did play a, a huge role in 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 ninety eight in Dublin. I can answer part of that. There are some letters in his memoirs to Moira um, because Moira is accusing him of being the editor or in charge yeah. of the press. And he actually states, you've got that wrong. I, I wrote, I wrote plenty, but I was not ever, ever in control. Yeah. So we don't know whether he's hiding it, but there we are. I, I, I would have thought just, uh, it's, it's not a historical point, but just a practical one that if the authorities are breathing down your neck and people are uh, be, being picked up, uh, people would just pitch in and do stuff. So he would find himself on an editorial role without actually ever being an official editor. And then that's quite an interesting bit because we were trying to work out where he was. You see, William, because he had land, you can actually see him signing off leases and things. So I'm still trying to work out where he was at various times. But I think he was very much a lawyer and kept out of it. I, I really do get that impression. So he was pretty up to stuff, but made sure he didn't look uh, like he was uh, involved. I, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. <laughs> I mean, Drennan is, Drennan is writing for the press. He's pretending that he's not writing for the press. He's pretending to Martin that he's not writing for the press, but he's writing for the press. And he's very, very worried when uh, Samson's house is raided 
that his handwriting yeah. is going to fall into the uh, fall into the hands of the attorneys. And in fact, I think it did because there's a there's a, 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 a cartoon in Drennan's hands with a poem that he wrote about the uh, the British Moor shooting, and that somehow got to the castle. And it didn't get to the it didn't get to the castle because Drennan's papers were never seized. It got to it, it, I I believe they were in Stanson's papers. Okay. Um, what happened this um well this is an interesting thing because he's still there his clear words that he'd gone over to take the uh, disinherited land the brother who actually was Michael Silk in a slightly different bit of land yes I believe so Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not too sure which colonel. Uh, anything else here online? Nope. Well, here, special thanks to Mark Dougherty for playing a switch in there on his, uh, his uh, the muscle, whatever it was, you know. So, and Sorry? Low whistle, you call it. I've never seen one before. But here, thank you very much to Fiona. Thank you. Thank you to speak for everybody here, saying that was a brilliant talk she did for us and extremely well-researched. And I know a lot more about William than I did at the very start this Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. And we will end there for tonight. Thank you to everybody for coming on.